Hi, welcome to Ability Fierce. I'm Michael Astor. Today I have with me as my guest the super advocate Nadina Lespina, and she's the author of this really cool book, Such a Pretty Girl. And it's a really moving story. Uh, I've been to a reading where she's read from it. I've read a little bit of it myself. And it's opened up, uh, told me a lot about disability activism because Nadina is one of the most important disability activists around and about how people deal with their disability in creative and interesting ways. So hello, Nadina. Hi. It's so nice to be here. <laughs> thank you for inviting <laughs> so, thank me. Thank you. I've been chasing after you for quite You've a while now. You've been chasing <laughs> me. I'm sorry. I was so hard to get. Well, it's okay. It, it <laughs> makes it that much greater to, to have you here. Um, one of the things that I was touched by in the book was that you talked about growing up in Sicily yes. and then coming here and your father coming here to America to cure you. And um, you have polio. Which I had polio when I was 16 months old. And by the way, the title of the book, Such a Pretty Girl, um, that's the refrain I heard, except it wasn't, oh, such a pretty girl, but such a pretty girl, what a shame, what a shame. So all this pity and uh, oppressive uh, religious atmosphere in this little town, uh, and my mother always uh, crying and um and not crying when, when she heard the people saying those things, when she heard her, the other people saying those things, um, feeling so sorry for her, the pity. Um, uh, that's, that's what I remember most about my childhood. And I remember my father wanted me to be cured, mm -hmm. um, taking me to Roma, to Roma, Catania, Bologna, to all the different cities, to all different doctors. Um, uh, he wanted me to be, to be cured and telling me, um, we're going to go uh, to America. I'm going to take you to America. And there, you're going to be cured. Um, and of course, my father wanted me to be cured because he loved me. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as a child, um, I didn't quite understand. Um, I didn't understand when people were saying, uh, such a pretty girl, why they were so sad, mm -hmm. so that I thought it would have been better if I was ugly. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand when my father kept talking about me getting cured, being cured. Uh, I didn't understand what there was to cure. I mean, I knew I could not walk. Mm -hmm. I knew I was different than everybody else. Um, and the fact that my father um, was so obsessed about getting me, the, getting me cured, um, made me feel that I was not good the way I was and that I was not the daughter that my father wanted, which was very, um, very painful to deal with. Um, and, uh, and I mean, even after we came to the U.S. Uh, and I was, uh, I went into the hospital for special surgery um, within a month that we came to the, to the U.S. And I'm an only child, by the way. Mm -hmm no brothers or sisters, um, so um, uh, the, my mother and my father and I came. Um, and in the hospital, they started doing surgery after surgery after surgery and uh, torturing me, really. Um, and, uh, and I felt uh, an obligation mm -hmm. that I, I had to go through all this. Um, not so much because I wanted to walk, mm -hmm. but because they wanted me to walk and because my father wanted me to walk. So I felt I had a duty after all he went through to get me to, to America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I saw a bit of myself in your father. Uh, you said that your father didn't want you in the wheelchair. I didn't want my son to use the wheelchair. And um, I think we made him use a walker, and he walks most places. Now he uses a mobility scooter, too, on his own power. And I think that was important.
because he has a different reception when people see him walking, but I also see that it gave you a great amount of freedom. From the beginning, I, I don't know, the, the, the very first time I sat in a wheelchair, I was, it felt so good. Mm -hmm. I loved, I still love this, I love the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, a, it's a great invention of man, of, of humankind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The wheel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the it, it, it wheel. Yeah. It. yeah. Um, but yes, uh, it, it is seen as a sign of, um, well, as a symbol of disability. As it is seen as a sign of failure. Not the walking is so important. Um, so no matter how difficult it is to walk, uh, and I did work very hard to be able to walk with braces and crutches after many surgeries. Um, and, um, and I kept falling and breaking my legs, <laughs> breaking my knees, my ankles. Um, but walking is seen as much better than, you know, than, than what, what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to walk. Mm -hmm. It is more normal. Mm -hmm. um, so it was all like uh, all the surgeries and all of that. I see it as a process uh, of uh, normalization rather than uh, treatment and cure, like trying to get you to be, to fit in, uh, to be as normal as, uh, as, as you can be. Um, and uh, I'm sure it was hard for your son, you know, and, and he worked very hard mm -hmm. to walk with the, it's not, I find that uh, that can be, that can be harmful to, to, um, to it makes you feel that, uh, that uh, uh, whatever you do is, is never enough. Mm -hmm. um, I have a scene in my, um, in the book where I'm first walking with braces and crutches. I don't know if you got to that part. Not yet, Not yet but uh, I am. Uh, they, they they let me bring the the braces and crutches to the floor because I was only um, doing it in physical therapy, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so I get all ready. And this is after I've had so many surgeries, including a spinal fusion, which was. Um, it's a tremendous surgery. Really, yeah. really torture. Mm -hmm. um, and I, um, I stand, you know, with my crutches on the braces, with the braces on the crutches, waiting for my parents to mm -hmm. get there. And, uh, and, and one of the nurses is um, um, going to tell me when they're coming so I can come out the door mm -hmm. so they can see me mm -hmm. standing up. And, and she does, and, and here my parents are coming, and I very carefully, you know, crutch and leg, you know, you have to do it just right, mm -hmm. uh, the way they taught, you know, they taught me to do in, uh, in uh, physical therapy. And my parents are coming, and, and, uh, and they're smiling, and my mother says, oh, you look so beautiful, you're so, look how tall you are. And my father says, yes, and I'm sure before long you'll be able to get rid of those sticks also and walk without the crutches. And that kind of, like, can you be happy yeah, you did this that I've done this much? It, it was so hard mm -hmm. for me to get to this point, to walk with the crutches, and to hear my father say that he's, it's not enough for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's never enough. You know, mm -hmm. and so to make a make a child, and at this point I was uh, 15, 16, mm -hmm. 16 actually, actually, to make make your child feel that they had to do more and more. There is a good side to it, yes, to to, to try and and do as much as you can and and uh, and accomplish as much as you can, of course, and we do that with children, not even with. The children who Typical. are not disabled mm -hmm. uh, always push, push, push. Uh, we try to, we want our children, to, you know, to to, uh, to achieve, to accomplish. But but when it's something that you know you really cannot do, mm -hmm. you know, I could not walk without the crutches. This was the very best I could do. It's I and think it, it's and it and it made me feel. Like I was failing my like father. Like a disappointment. Yeah, I was yeah. disappointing yeah. my father, failing my father. But I father. think it's it's hard to know 
what you can, or for a parent to know what the kid can and cannot do. And the most parents who have disabled kids don't have any ex prior experience. Of course, <laughs> so, no parents have well, prior experience. Some, some do, I mean, some do, you yeah. know. But uh, even having children, I mean, you know, so it's they a, you try know, usually to, parents They don't. deal with it in different ways. And of it's, course, it's, it's and you do the best you can, mm -hmm. you know, and I understand, you know, but it took me a while mm -hmm. um, to understand. And I, I always, throughout, I always knew how much my father loved me. Mm -hmm. And I loved, I adored my father. Um, my mother too, you know, mm -hmm. I love my parents are very good people and mm -hmm. I love them, love them very much. Um, so I, you know, at a certain point, uh, I stopped uh, feeling like I was a failure because I couldn't, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't get cured. But um, we should, yeah, I mean, I would say to parents uh, to, um, to try to avoid, um, especially, you know, certain language, not say that uh, um, uh, you, you um, uh, try to encourage them to do as much as possible while at the same time um, have realistic expectations and, 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 uh, and not make a child feel that, uh, that uh, the, way, the way you are is not good. Think, you know, like sometimes we use words like good and bad, you know, uh, try to, you have to walk better than that. You can do better than that. You have to walk better. That's not good the way you're walking now, you know. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> when my son was first diagnosed, my dad had a cousin who had cerebral palsy, mm. and I talked with him, and he said the most important thing was not to make the child feel that he was disappointing you. Yes. That's what he felt was he was always disappointing his parents. Yes. And that's all he wanted. I think it, if you talk to any of us who grew up with a disability, you'll hear that. Yeah. You'll hear that. Yeah. You know. So now how did you go, because you, I don't know if people in the uh, typical world, the non-disabled world, though, but you're really quite a advocate and you've been arrested numerous times and you've been really instrumental in calling attention to disability rights. How did you become such an activist? Um, well, I, I, I was um, at the right time, at the, in the right place at the right time, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but you're also uh, the was right person. I mean. And I was the right, yes, because I mean, some people, I mean, everybody's different. Mm -hmm. Um, some, I think from, I, I like to think that, uh, that uh, activism is in my blood. I remember my father, you know, going down to the square, in piazza, everybody <laughs> in piazza. Um, there would be a demonstration, you know, and he was, uh, and Sicily, he, he was always uh, he, talking about how Sicily was the poorest region and Italy, and, it, and of course, you know, Italy, really couldn't care less, the, the, the central government couldn't care less about uh, uh, Sicily and Sicilians who were seen as, as inferior, mm -hmm. you know, by Northern America, mm -hmm. uh, Northern Italians. Italians, yeah. Northern Italians. Um, so I remember that, you know, growing up, mm -hmm. hearing my father talking about justice and injustice, fighting injustice. Um, when I was, um, um, uh, then, uh, you know, after I, I, I mentioned the spinal surgery, I went to um, uh, what they call the convalescent home mm -hmm. um, because I was in a huge cast mm -hmm. all over my body, so I couldn't go home. My mother couldn't, couldn't really take care of me. Um, and, uh, and there, it was a little bit like being in a camp. Mm -hmm. They would uh, push us around in the bed because we couldn't, they couldn't get us out of bed in this big cast. And, and we had counselors. And, and those were the, the years, you know, when uh, I was hearing about the, the uh, march on Washington in 1963. Mm -hmm. I learned about the, the civil rights movement, about Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I, and uh, that got me so excited. Um, I remember wanting to be a freedom rider. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Imagine, you know, I mean, I, I was in a cast. <laughs> but I, so I always, I feel that. But then, uh, you know, in, um, well, when I came to the disability rights movement, really, when I, 
uh, got involved in the disability rights movement, some very bad things had been happening. Um, I don't want to reveal too much. I want people to read the book. Mm -hmm. But um, this girl, my very best friend that I had met in the hospital, um, had committed suicide. Um, she committed suicide because she was made to believe. She, she, all the messages that were all around us then were so negative. Um, she really felt that you know she would never have a, ha a happy life. Happy life. Right, and that's devastating. Uh, that was that's devastating. And I was in a deep depression after that, um, and uh, and trying to um, get myself uh, uh, looking for a for a lifeline, I guess. Uh, so I reached out to some disabled people I knew. And, and I had uh, heard about Judy Human, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know Ju Judy Human, um, who um, had uh, been denied a license to teach um, because she was using a wheelchair. Um, and uh, instead of going home and crying her eyes out like the rest of us would have done, she fought back. Right. And and uh, and sue the Board of Education and started Disabled in Action, which is the organization that's still active today, and I belong to, and uh, and that's uh, how it all started. I uh, I went to a meeting. I met Judy Human, and uh, and I remember listening in at the meetings, and then going home and writing uh, down and say and 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 realizing that it's not so much the disability that's bothering me, that's making me unhappy, but the way I'm treated because of the disability uh, and the way, and, and, the, and, and, and the fact that there aren't the supports uh, uh, that I need, the fact that the world is not made for those like me, you right, know? Right, you said uh, something interesting is it's not that I can't get into the building it's that there's there isn't a ramp for me right. to get into when the when we when that that was that's like a that was like this this switch mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden that before i mean yes there were stairs everywhere and you thought well poor me i can't go up those stairs because i can't walk right and then all of a sudden it's well you know, if only they put a ramp there instead of those steps, mm -hmm. I could get in. If there was an elevator in this place, I could go up to the, you know, it was uh, um, like a shift in, in the way of you frame thinking. It differently, yeah. Of thinking, uh, which then became known as the social mo model of disability, you know, versus the medical model of disability and the tragedy model of disability. Where it's, uh, you know, I taught disability studies at a certain point in my life at the new school. So that's how I um, started, you know, becoming active in the movement. And then I. Um, um, started becoming active with ADAPT, which is uh, um, the T-shirt. This shirt that I'm wearing is an ADAPT shirt. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I it shows in camera. camera. Yeah. Um, I true. may not show the whole. Um, yeah. Uh, but oh, good. Oh, wait, I whoop. think you just did it. <laughs> there. Yeah. That's now it. We can see it. It's yeah. an, ADAPT an ADAPT shirt, shirt, and it's an old one actually, because I think it was in 2001, because it was after. Um, so this is a vintage the world trades. shirt. Yeah, it's yeah. a vintage shirt. Yeah. But it says Laguna Honda. Laguna Honda is the largest uh, uh, nursing home in the country. And I've been wearing it lately mm -hmm. because uh, um, the Laguna Honda is still there. We, we went in, I think it was 2001, after the World Trade Center um, went down. Um, as a to because we were fighting, uh, you know, having people put in institutions. Right. We want services and supports at home, uh, and we went there because this was the biggest in the whole country. But lately, if you Google the last uh, year, the last few mo six months, um, there have been reports of incredible abuse in that place, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the nursing home is under. Um, investigation right now by the state. Um, so um, the one thing that uh, it didn't um, go away. It didn't. It, no, yeah. no, we didn't. I mean, you know, we we've been fighting this. Um, we've been we they, they're 
still today, you know, um, children that are put in institutions by their parents when they're children, and they spend their whole life in an institution till they die there. It's, uh, we, we, it's not a life. It's, it's not, it's not a life, of course. We say it's a serving a life sentence for the crime of having a disability. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, and, uh, you know, also people who become disabled later, later in life who are um, well, I think, I think put in institutions. One and of the things that, uh, that interests me is that if you, for example, if you put in ramps, it may be to help disabled people, but then as we grow older, we become, so it helps a lot of people, actually. It may help everyone if you get, if you live long enough, you know what I mean? Exactly. Um, if you live live long enough, uh, you're going to experience disability. Exactly. We say that disability is, a, is a, the minority that anybody at any time can join. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it is a normal uh, part of being human. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all have this human body, you know, with uh, with organs that fail, bones that break, everything, you know, from one moment to the next, you don't know what's going to happen. So I think uh, a lot of the pity that we see, and the other side of the medal, which is uh, which is the inspiration, oh, you know. Oh, you're, so, you're doing <laughs> such a great. Oh, yeah, you're so yeah, inspirational. Yeah. Um, is like, trying to put this uh, this wall up uh, because it's uh, it's too difficult for people to identify to to say oh this could very well happen to me or no, no, talking to you as a father this people. could very well be yeah. my, my child right. and that was the message of the telethons by the way mm -hmm. you know to tell people to get money from people uh the in the the telethon would you know, the, the, that's Lewis what they would, Jerry yeah, Lewis yeah. would say, send money and, you know, be grateful that your, that your children are not like these poor, unfortunate children. Right. Um, but, but then I was thinking even more because you were at the Close the Camps rally. I saw you there and you got arrested and they couldn't even put you <laughs> in the paddy wagon because it wasn't accessible. Um, and just, that was an, a, a sort of ironic situation. Um, but w you said something that it touched me very much was it's every struggle, the disability struggle, every struggle is, is linked. I do. I feel that uh, uh, it's all one struggle. I mean, uh, uh, we are the uh, unwanted, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they would rather either by curing us or by putting us away, uh, you know, and and institutions and warehousing us, you know, um, get us out of the way, um, the unwanted. And uh, yeah, at the Disability Pride Parade in my uh, speech, mm -hmm. I said, uh, you know, that, uh, tear down. It used to, it, that day happened to be Bastille Day. Mm -hmm. So I said, uh, tear down the walls, uh, you know, no walls. Right, uh, right. Either, either keeping people in or keeping people out. I feel I f there is, um, um, and today the word that's used a lot is intersectionality, uh, which is the uh, the tell everything connection. Every, everything is right. Uh, everything is um, is connected. It's all, and I believe it is one all one struggle. Um, and the disable disability is the one. I, identity, you know that anyone that, that, can join. And yes, I yeah. said I said yeah. before the one the one mi the minority anyone ca yeah. can join, uh, and and so we intersect with all the other groups. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I am, you know, disabled. I am a woman, mm -hmm. so I'm discriminated against as a woman. I'm an immigrant, mm -hmm. so I very much identify with uh, with immigrants. Um, so, and with all oppressed groups. Right, which is, um, which is why I think we, I think we have as a, as a species the ability to resolve these issues. But I think we need to have some kind of revolution in the way we're looking at them because everyone's stuck in saying, well, you can't do this or you can't, or there's not enough money for this, or they all have a reason for it.
There's no, but, not enough money. I mean, that, that we hear that all the time. But, but, and it's not a question of money. It's a question of priorities. Right, exactly. It's, uh, you know, the United States spends more on the military than the next sure. eight countries or ten countries yeah. put together. If we spent some of that money on our veterans. Exactly. Um, you know, to make them whole because they went and sacrificed their well-being for the country. And that's the basic thing. But I think that it becomes the economy grows when disab disabled people are included in the economy and Absolutely. are living. And we, Absolutely, we don't yes. have to spend all this time and all these bureaucrats making sure that you're not getting too much. Or That is uh, such a disgrace. Mm -hmm in this country, really, it is. It is it's so disgraceful. Um, uh, talking especially about health care, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that uh, certain services, uh, well, the fact that we don't have uh, a national program, and so we have this segmented system where some people, those people who work, have insurance uh, through their employer, and those people who, who are, you know, the over 65 get Medicare, or if you're disabled, uh, you uh, and have worked, you get Medicare, but if you're disabled and have not worked, then if you're poor enough, you get Medicaid. And if you need what's called long-term care, mm -hmm. um, we, we prefer the term long-term services and supports, mm -hmm. um, then uh, you you can only get it mm -hmm. um, if you're uh, um, rich and can afford to pay for it out <laughs> of pocket, or if you're poor enough to qualify for Medicaid. So I think we did a nice little show here. And um, oh, well. I'm thinking I might cut it into two shows because it's a 28-minute show. We've been talking we've a been long talking. time. <laughs> yeah, and usually when I do it, I talk and I have to cut. Mm -hmm. uh, it's short, but I think we have a nice, a nice one. And um, can I get the uh, camera just on me? Yeah. Not to um, ignore Nadina, but um, okay. ah, so this is her book. And now that you've listened to this amazing talk that we've had, you can go and pick it up. It's on Amazon. Is it in the bookstores? It's in uh, in the bookstores. I mean, if you if you're in New York City, it's, it's certainly you can find signed copies still mm -hmm. at uh, Barnes and Noble at Union Square, mm -hmm. um, and any bookstore. And if they don't have it, tell them they should them stock it. They yeah. should get yeah, it. They, they get should stock it. Such a pretty girl. You can get it from <laughs> University Press from NYU, mm -hmm. um, and and what. NYU University Press or Amazon. Uh, Amazon, you can get anything from Amazon, That's true. please. <laughs> so, so get the book, read it. Barnes and you'll, Noble. You'll, it's a good read. It'll teach you a lot, and it's it's a good story. Even I tried to make it a, a story. A, a, yeah. I wrote it like an as if I was writing a novel, but it's the truth. It's my story. It's, it's the my... true novel of Nadina Lesbian. Thank you so much. Thank for you. Here and Thank you. Fierce. Thank you so much for tuning in at home. And uh, we just got renewed today for another season, which is good. And we're going to be coming. We're going to be coming at you more and more. I don't know if anyone could be better than Nadina, but we're going to get more and more interesting guests. And we're <laughs> we're helping our visuals, and we're looking slicker. So uh, stay tuned, uh, and we'll see you soon. <laughs> Oh, my God.